I was a student here, and I uh, decided I wanted to join the Jesuits. And the president of uh, St. Joe's College at that time was Father John Long. And uh, if you're a candidate to enter the Jesuits, you have interviews with various people, and the rector of the Jesuit community was one of them. So Father Long interviewed me. And yeah, he knew me uh, from, I was pretty active on the campus. And one of the questions that they ask a candidate for entrance into the society is a deal breaker question, and it's this. And the way he asked it, he reached behind him and he pulled off a book, which I later realized was the province catalog. It had the names and addresses of people in the province, wherever they were. And he pulled it and went through, he said, now Bill, he said, we have men in India, we have men in the Philippines, he said, are you willing to go anywhere in the world? Now, if you're not willing to go anywhere in the world as a Jesuit, they won't take you. So I said, sure. That was one of the things that appealed to me. I'd been in the Army and uh, came back here. Well, I went through my initial training in the Jesuits at Wernersville, went to St. Louis, and then I had to go into what we call Regency, that period where you teach for a couple of years. You're not yet ordained. It's between the study of philosophy and the study of theology. And I was sent to Scranton Prep. So I arrived at Scranton Prep, and the first morning I was there at breakfast, who do I see but follow along? He was then the rector of the Jesuit community at Scranton and the president of the University of Scranton. And I said, hey, do you remember when you pulled that book off and you asked me if I'd be willing to go? I said, you didn't say anything about Scranton. And he said, oh, he said, you're going to love it here. It's a great place. Well, anyway, it is a, a, a great place. Uh, it, it has a good tradition, the early tradition of the Christian brothers who established it. Uh, when it transferred over to the Jesuits around 1942, I think, they had something like, oh, maybe 25,000 in the bank, and they had maybe debt of 150,000. Uh, and the Jesuits took it, and the GI Bill which paid for college education for returning veterans, that was a turnaround for the university. It was an all-male school at that time. And uh, these guys from that area had no other options for higher education in the area, so it took off. And uh, I'd say the contribution that the university has made has been absolutely enormous, particularly in the fields of medicine, although they don't have a medical school, they did have a strong pre-med program, still do, a strong pre-law program, and very strong in accounting. So they've done many, many, many other things since then, but uh, those fields were really strong, and they just fed the, uh, the teaching community, the, the uh, uh, school system up there. Anyway, they've made a major impact. If you go up to the University of Scranton today, you look, in, you look at it, and you'd never know that it was an urban renewal neighborhood, really. And there was a street that went right through the middle of the campus. That street is now called the Commons, the University of Commons. It's got these Z bricks on it. It's very attractive. But we had uh, automobiles running up and down right through the campus. There were buildings on both sides. You might have a kid picking a fender out of his hip sometime, you know, ambulances went right up and down. And uh, we decided we'd like uh, to close that street and make a uh, campus commons and have a more coherent campus. It was very, very controversial. The uh, hill section neighborhood, that's what that's called because the university is on a hill. Uh, the people that lived up above, they were very opposed to it. And they had a variety of reasons for being opposed to it. Not all of them were noble reasons. But in any case, a former chairman of the city council, whose name was Jim Doherty, uh, I should, yeah, former chairman, because he remained on the council, and he was a good friend of the Jesuits. He had gone to Holy Cross himself, and he was a good friend of mine. And after I settled in, he came to see me one day, he was still on the council, but was no longer chairman. And he said, we got to get that resolution through to close the street. And he said, let's get going on it. It was a five-member city council. And Doherty kind of engineered the thing quietly. We got it through on a 3-2 vote. And some of those guys were a little bit slippery, and they were trying to 
act as if they were for it, but they were really against it. And they wrote it in a way that they thought we could never really do it. But they had a 3-2 vote to vacate the right-of-way. In other words, the city would vacate the right-of-way on the street, and uh, then we could uh, own it and do what we wanted with it. They made the mistake of putting a couple of dates in there. Uh, I forget exactly what the point of the date was, but one was like on June 6th, something would happen. Well, on June 7th, we threw a bulldozer into the street and started tearing it up. And I got a call from the guy at the news. There would be banner headlines in the newspaper uh, about the controversy with the Hill section neighbors against the university in closing the street. And this guy, Tony Canella, who was a uh, writer for the, he, called, he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, that ordinance said June 6th, it's June 7th, we're moving. And they passed it 3-2. Well, it proved to be the best thing that happened because it brought that university together in a coherent way. And now if you walk up there and take a look, you'd say, gee, what a beautiful campus. Well, it was not a beautiful campus in those early days, but it is now. It'd be wonderful it had a, if it had an enormous endowment. It's got a modest endowment, but if it were a really enormous endowment, it would be terrific because from that endowment, you would get operating income every year that could support faculty, could support student scholarships. It's uh, the, the whole issue these days in higher education is the uncertainty of the, uh, uh, the financial future of independent colleges. And then you, you look and you say, what kind of a debt burden are students carrying? And the debt burden is prohibitive for a lot of people. Well, the way you overcome that is get a really good, solid endowment. So that's what I would say the best thing that could happen to them right now would be a terrific endowment. Another very good thing would be to have an infusion of young men who want to be Jesuits and get more Jesuits there, uh, because like all of the Jesuit colleges, there are fewer Jesuits available now. But a lot of those lay people, they are exposed to the uh, experience of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. They understand the spirituality and they want to communicate it. So the future is, is good. There are a lot of committed lay Catholics and some who are not Catholic, by the way, uh, who really want to see the ideals of Jesuit education continue and uh, they're willing to invest their own lives, their professional lives in it. So uh, I'd say the future is good, quality education and uh, the Jesuit tradition. Hey, they have wonderful students, wonderful faculty, great town, it's received in that town. And congratulations, Scranton, on 125 great years. Happy anniversary.